Hey, this is Luis. I am so, so excited to bring you this episode. Over the last three months, the podcast has grown significantly. These last three months, we've actually did the same amount of downloads of the 18 previous months before we started on the network. And there's some elements that we want to break down and uh, look at it as the quarterly reporting for Content is Profit. I'm super excited. We're actually going to be super transparent with the numbers. We're going to share everything that we've done over the last three months to grow the podcast. Uh, we actually 5X'd the amount of monthly downloads and we've been able to rank two, top 2% two in the world. Super excited. Pat in the back. <laughs> and thank you so much for all you listening and enjoying the show every single day and giving sharing feedback with us because it has helped us grow the show. This is a very special episode. So I have two questions for you. Have you ever wondered how the bit networks grow their shows? How can a podcast achieve over 1 million downloads per month on a consistent basis? Heads up, this is actually a rerun with one of our amazing friends, Jonathan Barshop, head of podcast growth at the Hospital Podcast Network. And this episode is really, really special because it aired about a week or two before we actually joined the network that changed everything on the show for us. So there's been two stages in the show when we launched at the uh, 2020 and he saved our business. And now this is like part two of the show and evolution as part of the Hospital Podcast Network. So some of the golden boards that we share is how he co-founded the go-to podcast booking agency for B2B. So very important. He shares some amazing tips uh, for B2B podcasting. The two-sentence killer cold outreach email and the unconventional way he landed a job with the Hotspot Podcast Network. Super awesome. Super excited uh, to share this interview with you. If you have not heard it before, please go ahead. Take a listen. There's a list of very specific things that we want to share with you that if you take maybe a couple of those and you implement today on your show, we guarantee that you will grow enjoy this was actually a pretty compelling hook if we saw them on another podcast odds are it was a good experience they had it they had a great time and so we would just email them saying hey we saw you that you're on this podcast do you have any interest in getting, getting booked on other podcasts and that that response rate was surprisingly high it was just literally two sentence two yeah. sentence email and people ate that up you know for us when we bring our guests like it's it's us like we don't have a ea or a va that that does it that's our decision because we love to connect on a one-on-one -on -one with our guests before they come in and, and build that relationship it's a big part of what we do and, mm -hmm. and how we do it um so i think also an important point is like you made the process like your own and you were so proactive i mean these are all things that you've probably read in a million blog posts but mm -hmm. like it's really important to like think of this when you're when you're about to hit someone up it's like what's in it for them how can I articulate this in the simplest and clearest way possible and sort of just like make it a no brainer? Nope, nope, we don't go. All right, here we go. <laughs> We've got hey, I'm Luis. And I'm Luis. And so you're listening you to the Content is before. Profit podcast, where we talk about entrepreneurship, mindset, and of course, how to turn your content into profit. But most importantly, where we come here and have a really, 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 really good time, baby. So go to contentsprofit.com and join the community. You like that spin? I saved it. I know, you saved it. T take a deep breath before we continue. There, there we go. go. Good got job. It. Now, what are we talking about today? Are you throwing it back at me, man? Oh my God. All right. Episode 243, how to grow your podcast by 40% or more than 40% in three months. Let's go. I that know, deserves that, one of these. That, that was like a, a rough calculation that I did with the, the data that they threw at us, you know? I know. So, sounds so clickbaity, by the way. Hopefully my math is right. <laughs> I know. It, it, is, uh, it is very clickbaity. So cli yeah, it's all good. But I, I think it's going to be a good conversation. That's it. To be able to do that, there's so much more. I hope you're ready for today's guest. If you are looking to substantially grow your podcast, to learn the strategies from one of the new hottest podcast networks out there, then this is the conversation for you. This is going to be epic. Today's guest is the head of podcast growth for the recently formed HubSpot Podcast Network, which has massive podcasts such as Entrepreneur on Fire, Gold Digger, and one of her favorites, My First Million. That's right, and check this out. Today's guest is responsible for growing My First Million podcast from 700,000 monthly downloads to more than a million monthly downloads in just three months, meaning My First Million got their first million thanks to today's <laughs> guest. <laughs> my blowing, please welcome the head of podcast growth at HubSpot, your go-to podcasting genius, Jonathan Marshall! <laughs> <laughs> what the? That was epic. <laughs> Appreciate it. How you doing, Jonathan? Welcome. Great. 
great. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Oh, Absolutely. Man. Yeah. I'm going to give some background on what happened before going live. <laughs> We've been spending like 30 minutes behind the scenes. You know, we would call this rapport building. <laughs> but we were trying to figure out how to go live today. It was a struggle. <laughs> it's totally our offer, by the way. Just saying. Just saying. We're just talking about this event. Like, plan A. If it doesn't go right, plan B. What is it? Plan C. And uh, today we failed, Jonathan. Yeah, but we just had a plan we're A. Excited. <laughs> just plan A. Yeah. How you doing, man? How's your week going? Good, yep. good. Going well. Appreciate y'all having me. This is a high energy show. Y'all have a fucking awesome production here. Let's I go. I'm excited to dive in. Appreciate it. I think Thank we you. should, uh, I'm going to make a, a call out here. <laughs> Red Bull sponsor us so we can send Red Bulls to all of our guests and, you know, just even ra raise the level higher up. Oh, boy. Um, dude, okay. So here's the thing. I think. You and the next two people are coming, which we won't announce yet, is like a dream guest for us. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and the reason is because of what you have created with the network and the shows that you guys have in the network have added so much. But I'm literally addicted to my first million. Like if <laughs> if every every morning I'm like a new episode release, like can you guys do the daily also on my first million? And it's, it, it's become like this cornerstone of inspiration bounce ideas new perspectives and different things so thank you so much for bringing out to that to the world and to the audience that the people are listening or watching right now mm -hmm. this is th this is the incredible thing about publishing and uh, the positive impact that you can create for somebody else so i just wanted to say thank you to you in person because it's meant so much uh what you guys have been doing consistently over some time now I appreciate that, but I can't take any credit because that's all Sam and Sean. Like, they have been at it for, like, two, three years at this point. And, I mean, as you said, like, it's super addicting. I'm the same way. I started out as <laughs> it was my favorite show, and I was like, how do I get a job with these guys? And Incredible. that's a whole story in itself, but yeah, that was the impetus of it. It was like, I need to work with these guys because what they're doing is incredible. Yes, awesome. I love it, man. So I want to hear the story, but before that, you know, I'm guessing there there used to be this person called Jonathan Barshop. Pretty cool, <laughs> right? Going around town and eventually you got interested into podcasting and, you know, maybe you started a, th uh, a thing here and there. So why don't you share a little bit about your story? How did you get into the scene podcasting and maybe how did you get then into working for HubSpot? Yeah, I always say like I somehow I'm like the guy who like sneaks backstage at a concert and ends up like going into the VIP and hanging out with Drake type thing. <laughs> like I started out just basically like uh, graduated in 2014, was in a desk job in a cubicle, like hating life. Like I think most people kind of are right out of college. And um, during that time, I just filled a lot of it with podcasts. So I was listening to Tim Fair show, how I built this, that kind of stuff. Mm. And I was taking a lot of notes on them um, just for like my own personal sort of journal. And I was like, yeah. at a certain point, I had this huge directory of notes. And I'm like, what do I do with this? Like, I maybe turn it into a newsletter, a website. So I started Googling around and I found this was this website called The Podcast Wire. And Eric Jacobson, who ended up being my co-founder in our podcast agency, he was yeah. running it where basically he was doing what I was doing. He's taking these like incredible podcasts, whether it's Tim Ferriss or, you know, whatever, summarizing it down in two, to 250 words and yeah. making it a weekly newsletter. And I was like, oh perfect i'm already doing this and he's so awesome. got some traction already so he cold emailed him and he's like i'm looking for someone to help me with this mm. so i while i was working the desk job i was like kind of it was one of those jobs where you can really get away with whatever <laughs> like as long as you just get the deliverables out the door when yeah. they need to be and so i feel like i was spending like honestly like 75 percent of my time just doing stuff not work related all <laughs> sort of like podcast focused and so for basically a year we yeah we uh, rebranded the podcast wire into a thing called startup mixtape.fm which mm -hmm. is a big directory of some yeah. of the best podcasts out there. It, we haven't updated it since like 2018, but there's some incredible, incredible shows on there if anyone wants to check that out. We'd also like do uh, podcaster slash creator like profiles. Yeah. So we interviewed like um, Alex Bloomberg, of uh, oh. founder of, of Gimlet, uh, mm. Jordan Harbinger, mm. and oh, wow. just kind of asked them like, what, what are some of your favorite podcasts? So we kind of tried to make this sort of content um, newsletter uh, website thing out of it. Eventually, Eric uh, was building out lemon pie our agency in the background and he was like oh we work really well together on this thing why don't we team up on that thing yeah so that's where the podcast agency came about and the podcast agency started as basically a guest booking agency and evolved into a full sort of we did production we sort of did a little bit of everything yeah and um i'll, I'll stop there awesome <laughs> by the way um i relate so much to the part of like you have this job and then you work on your thing on the side right I, it, that, that's such a that's like 
a, such a cool time and experience and, and, and growth, you know, primer, I guess, per, on the personal growth because you're, you're chasing, you know, what, what you want to do. Um, I'm curious, do you ever see yourself as building something um, or was it something out of frustration from that day job or something that, that were happening at the time? Yeah, I think I was just really hungry to mm. um, not even necessarily like do my own thing, but I was just like, I, I see what all my friends are doing and they seem to be happy, but I'm not. And, mm. it, it, you know, there's like a whole conversation in that itself. But yeah. I was like, I, I can't do this. I need to find a better solution. I love podcasting. And so when Eric offered me the job, basically taking like a, a severe cut, but, you know, to yeah. sort of build my own thing. Um, I was like, no brainer. So I, I moved back with my mom for a year to to make it happen. And then, sh you know, shortly after moved to Austin. But I was like, I would rather live at home with my mom and figure this thing out because <laughs> yeah. it's way more fun versus absolutely. being, you know, in, on the hamster wheel kind of doing the whole, you know, nine to five thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's let, let's be clear. It's not for everybody. Not everybody's willing to take mm -hmm. those risks, right, to move back with your mom or take a big pay cut. But at the end of the day, if you are happy, and I know it sounds so cliche, but if it, you're happy doing, right, chasing what you want to build, at the end of the day, it's probably going to be worth it. And don't get me wrong, there's going to be challenges, yeah. up and downs, probably a lot of downs, and you're going to go to some dark places, and you're going <laughs> to reconsider everything. But then when you see the results, yeah. it feels so good, right? Yeah. And then totally. life unexpectedly throws you opportunities, right? Like, for example... The, the one that you're having right now. I mean, I remember when HubSpot released their network and I was like, dude, this is amazing. And I think it was when they acquired the hustle and they grabbed my first million and they started the whole network thing. And I was like, I'm going to apply this apply. And I just been like pretty much like closely following uh, what podcast they're putting in and they're doing such a smart thing. And you're like in the middle of all that. Right. So you went from pretty much being a, podcast fanatic if you want to put it that way right like you really mm -hmm. enjoy podcasts and you decided to build something around what you enjoy mm -hmm. to now being probably in one of the most exciting networks out there there's other network networks that have a whole lot of other podcasts but and i don't know if it's because we're in the entrepreneurial world but we love the whole idea that you, what you guys are putting together yeah but before we go there I'm pretty curious. You're just launching hooks today. Like, uh, hook and, <laughs> oh, open, oh, open loops <laughs> open right here. Loops. Uh, you know, before we go there, I, I, I'm curious of exploring your uh, experience in lemon pie, right? And I, I'm curious because we have an agency of our own. We don't do the podcast production side of things, right? We work with the content that comes out of that. But it is hard work. And, you know, managing clients, finding the clients, it it takes a lot of work. So based on your experience, what does it take to grow an agency, right? And what maybe if you want to share, what was it that led you to moving on to the next thing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so me and my co-founder had a really good sort of like relationship. He was sort of like the CEO sales. So he was great on as far as like, if he got someone on a call, he was an assassin and could pretty <laughs> much close anyone game over um yeah. we also had a really unique hook where where we weren't like every other agency out there pr agency out there we just focused on p podcast pr essentially like mm. podcast booking so people would come to us and maybe they're a ceo of a company or an author we didn't work with a ton of authors we kind of tried to position ourselves in the b2b space because that's just where more more money is yeah um but we positioned ourselves as like the podcast booking agency. And yeah. so CEOs and founders would come to us and we'd get them booked on, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 plus shows wow. um, for as long as they worked with us. And so the way we would get those leads is we basically just had um, an EA kind of scrape lists of founders and CEOs and C-suite execs at different uh, companies that either just got funding or were well-funded. We worked with HubSpot. We worked with FreshBooks. We worked with you know, wow. D2C brands like Four Sigmatic, the coffee company, yeah. um, kind of all over the place. And a lot of that was just based off literally cold outreach saying, hey, yeah. we saw you. Uh, w this was actually a pretty compelling hook. If we saw them on another podcast, odds are it was a good experience. They had it, they had a great time. And so we would just email them saying, hey, we saw you, that you're on this podcast. Do you have any interest in getting, getting booked on other podcasts? And that that response rate was surprisingly high. It was just literally two sentence, two yeah. sentence email and people ate that up. So 
Mm. Um, you know, when we delivered for them, like we, we didn't just like, you know, talk shop. We, we actually like did good work. And so, yeah, I mean, a lot of it was just based on cold outreach and that's, that's how we would book people on shows. That's how, you know, th that's like the, the sort of my core skill set is like cold outreach and getting people's attention. And that's how we built the company pretty much. That's, that's awesome. So yeah. I, I'll share a little bit. I don't know what you have in mind, Fonzie, but I'll share a little bit of how we got to where we are now to like to, to, to relate a little bit, but um, we started in a community, right? Like uh, in our business or the, we started Biz Rose seven years ago. It's vinyl stickers, screen printing t-shirts, mm -hmm. online brand, this one right selling here. social media to restaurants. <laughs> like we pivoted probably like 15 different times. And with every pivot, it was a new lesson, right? And we stood together and it was freelancing mode at the time, right? Finally, we invest in this uh, in one of our coaches and uh, we dial it into just one thing, one process. And, and that's what allowed us to, to grow um, a lot compared to where we were before. Now, the community that we were in, like we're, we're trying to communicate with the same community and we quickly found that maybe the money was not there, right? And maybe the, and we, it, it took us a, a, a good amount of time to learn that lesson and a lot of pain. I'm like, man, like, is our product not the right product? Like, is the audience not the right audience? And, you know, for, for us, maybe when we started the show in 2019, right? No, 2020, well, March 2020. 2020 um, the outreach to get people inside of the show was was not a hard thing, right? Because we're passionate about this. Like, I think just the energy like attracts a lot of a lot of it. Um, I do think that we provide a ton of value here, but also we okay we started connecting that to to the business side and allowed us to create that um, market research as as we were publishing as well and elevating that side. Uh, but it's 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 been hard because of the the world that we started on the bootstrap world, right? We're like, oh man, we need to shift. So with our current coach, we had the conversation. We're like, where do we move, right? Is it B2B? Is it agencies, right? So we, you know, we started in the last month or so, we started working with two or three agencies and the process there has been a lot of friction because of the back end, and that every agency has a different process. And it's like, oh my gosh, now we have to adapt to that, right? On the, on the product side. Now, uh, so my reflection here is like, okay, where you start on your background will dictate a lot, maybe the speed, right? Maybe how you operate, right? You mentioned EA, like an executive assistant that you have SOPs, you have processes, right? So how much of that, of your past, maybe of the things and the experiences and the things that, that you did before that, how much did that affect? Or was there a learning process as you guys were doing this? Because a lot of people that tune into us, they're probably developing a product. They're probably developing a, a business on the side and they might be learning on the go or they're bringing skills with them. So how was that experience for you? Yeah, I, I mean, so spot on. It's like you, you're you running an agency and then one client asks like, hey, can you do this? Like, can you, uh, you're already doing content for us. Why don't y'all just like produce the podcast? And you're like, yeah, we can do that. And then you start like kind of taking on this like, octopus of like different <laughs> yeah. responsibilities and, and stuff that you never like really anticipated just because like a the money's there and you're like b like yeah i, I think i could do this mm -hmm. and what you quick, quickly realize is like you you're kind of trying to juggle too much and it just kind of becomes a lot and so i think what i would recommend is like just specialize in one thing like y'all y'all specialize in content and that's really smart because everyone needs content um i think you know like we specialize in booking and kind of it, like i said we sort of did production and we did like a few other things but then we just eventually always came back to pr book. podcast booking like full disclosure we had a production arm in the company and we completely shut it down this was actually after i left but mm. shut it down because it was just kind of a nightmare to, to to manage all that yeah so like i think that's just very natural to have sort of that shiny object object syndrome and sort of like you, you sort of have to chase the cat's tail a few times to realize like that it's not you know, all it's cracked yeah. up to be. And there's a lot of downsides with it, but you can only learn that through experience. And who knows, like maybe you build this agency that kind of is like a one-stop shop and it's incredible. Um, but I, I think it's in people's best interest to kind of figure out like what their special sauce is mm. and just double down on that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think there's also two other lessons on what you shared before, right? On, on how you guys were getting your clients. First, you guys were clear on who you were targeting and a lot of people right and we've been through this journey where we thought we were clear on who we were targeting and we had the totally wrong customer avatar if you want to call <laughs> it that way right i mean we were targeting people that didn't have the purchasing power to afford the service so then we were asking ourselves why are we having such a difficult time selling this thing right well it makes total sense right they cannot afford it you guys were extremely smart and said, what are the companies that are being funded? They just have an influx of cash in the B2B space that are looking to literally 
be everywhere, be everywhere, looking for a lot of exposure, and that was your target, right? Very, very smart. So again, that's lesson number one right there for you listening. Ask yourself, am I 100% clear on who do I want to work with? And also, are is that person capable <laughs> of, uh, you know, acquiring your services? Because if they're not, um, you might, I mean, if you are all about 100% free work and just, you know, give <laughs> back to forward. the world. Yeah, pay it forward. That's, that's, that's great, too. I'm not complaining about that. Uh, and the other lesson that I saw that I love is that cold outreach, right? You just sending emails. You said that two sentence it just works like a charm. <clears throat> and I'm curious, how much have you used that skill throughout your life? Was that natural for you? Did you feel awkward at first <laughs> sending these emails, right? Knocking on people's doors. And... Did you use this same skill to maybe obtain the opportunity in which you are right now? Totally. It, it's maybe like the most valuable skill I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's super learnable for everyone. And it, yeah, it's taken me from like uh, getting clients uh, to getting, you know, guests on big shows to landing this job. And it's like, I think, you know, there's like, I could sort of break down the, the you know, approach, at least in my mind. Sure. It's, it's kind of just like, you know, I guess you could break down each of those separately of like, okay, how do you reach out to someone, your podcast, like to get on their podcast? How do you reach out to someone like Sam to get his attention? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I guess the thesis is kind of this. It's just like, what's in it for them? And mm -hmm. I mean, these are all things that you've probably read in a million blog posts, but mm -hmm. like, it's really important to like, think of this when you're, when you're about to hit someone up, it's like, what's in it for them? How can I articulate this in the simplest and clearest way possible? And sort of just like make it a no brainer. So like mm. when I would reach out to podcasts, uh, this was not a foolproof method, but like what I would do is I would start off by saying, Hey, um, love your show so mm. much so that I just left you a five star review. And in that review, I would like attach it at the bottom. And nice. in that review, like it would be like a really thoughtful, like, like message. And so it's a, it's a thoughtful message and it's a value add for them because they get a review. And then I'd kind of go into the email and say, Hey, um, if you know, I, I know you don't typically take guests or whatever, you know, you kind of have to do your research there, but like, yeah, no, you yeah. don't typically take, take guests or whatever, but would love it if you consider Sam as, a, you know, Sam has built these incredible companies. Here's three or four things that he can teach your audience. And that's a really important indicator mm -hmm. there is like, you don't want to, you don't want to say, Hey, Sam has done this and he's done that. And he's done all these cool things. Like no one really cares at the end of the day. Like, yeah, yeah. those are good markers, but like really what the, what podcasters and what people care about again is like, what's in it for them. So when you're reaching out to a podcaster, I would always be like, okay, here's the five or so things that yeah. he can teach your audience. That would be a value add. Um, yeah. And then just wrap it up by saying, you know, absolutely no sweat if it's not a fit or the timing isn't right. Um, you know, PS, here's the media kit. So that's kind of like the general framework. And that kind of works, holds true if you're trying to hit up Sam in the DMs or whatever. It's so like, mm. hey, Sam, Yeah. And, and, you know, you kind of have to restructure things a little bit, but it's like, what's in it for them? Yep. How can I add value up front and have zero expectations? Yeah. By the way, if we would have received a message from you guys, I think it would have been like, yes, every single time. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. We have we have this email attached to probably, I think it's listen notes, to be honest. And uh, we get every every single day there's something there. And like, there's some attempt of doing it that way. But I... I take a second to read it, right? And then I also take a second to answer sometimes. I'm like, awesome. What was your favorite part of this episode? Whatever, right? Because they just yeah. are very general and then you don't hear from them at all, right? Because exactly. here's full disclosure for the ones listening, right? Like for us, we obviously deal with people that produces content, right? So people that do podcasts might also produce content, visual. Uh, mm -hmm. So for us, that agency could also be a source of leads if it's a good relationship. So if, is it my best interest to respond back and see if there's a relationship there? But it's incredible how many people don't respond back to these things, right? Yeah. Which could also mean an opportunity for them, right? Like if the, if the question is, are, am I serving my client? Am I serving the people that I work with in the best of my ability? That's probably not the scenario. <clears throat> so let this be a lesson of like what to do and also what not to do whenever you're reaching yeah. out, whether that's your service or, or something else. I have totally. a, and I think that's okay. that's that's a big differentiator, right? Like like that was the reason why we were able to kind of like charge higher premiums and deliver yeah. better uh, results was because we weren't just like spraying and praying like I, I'm sure a lot of the emails <laughs> you get where it's all templatized and you don't get a response when you yeah. even, you know you like ping them a few times and every email we sent like for the most part at least was totally personalized. So yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, and it's it's crazy how. Uh, how like you can just like 
uh, really different, like really stand out from the crowd by just being like literally like 5% better. It's, it's not, doesn't take a lot, yeah. but it's just like, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think investing the time up front to actually do some real research about the other person goes a long way. It'll just set you apart. I, I still remember this one that we <laughs> received one day. It was an assistant pitching somebody, right? I mean, who they were working for. And the way they did it, it honestly like upset me a little bit because they were like, yeah. oh, we listened to your stuff. We actually left your review and they screenshotted, not the review, but they screenshotted kind of like the when box they, when you're typing type. it. So they hadn't uh, submitted it yet. It was just a screenshot of that. And I was like, oh, nice. And I go and I like check the reviews and I never saw that review. So I'm like, these people just like type it and they don't actually publish the review. <laughs> right. And they expect it, it was also a very general email. So I answer, right. I was like, I don't remember the exact answer. I try not to be too rude or anything, but yeah. I was like, hey, awesome. Yeah. What was your favorite part of the podcast? I, w I would love, you know, the episode no, no that I listened to. And yeah, people just disappear, right? And that yeah, lack yeah. of follow through as well. I, I feel, okay, maybe if you, let's say you send that general message, if they get back to you asking what part of the, the episode that you enjoy the most, guess what? Go and listen to the episode and then tell them which right. part you enjoy as well. Um, yeah. But it's like people so expect... Much, oh, yeah. So much of my success with outreach is in the follow-up game, like you mm, said, because yeah. they, the, they get the first email and that's sort of like the media kit, right? Like that's yep. like here's Sam or whoever, here's why they're cool, here's what they can teach your audience. And then from there, it's like, they either respond pretty instantly because they're like, yes, this is a great fit, or yeah. they're like, whatever, send it mm -hmm. to the side. And so the follow-up game is like almost more important than the actual initial email. And like, that is where you can really, like, that was like, honestly some of my favorite parts because then you'd have to spend time to do a little bit of research and figure out, I would like, I would do some like probably too intense stuff, but I would like go to their Twitter, figure out what they're interested in. Like, oh, they like, uh, Game of Thrones. Let me find a funny Game of Thrones gif. Yes. And then I'll throw that in the follow-up email and just be like, hey, did you catch, you know, this last episode? Crazy. Like, whatever. You know, yep, that yeah, kind of absolutely. stuff. And that was that was because at the end of the day, like, like when people send those templatized emails, like you said, it's like, this is probably just a robot. This is probably just, you know, a one-click like mass email blast. But the moment I know there's an actual human on the other side, like, that kind of changes the dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, this might sound a little creepy, but... You know, I had add, I added you on Instagram today. I was like, oh man, this guy has an Instagram. Let's go follow him. And I noticed that you are like the the master of crockpots too. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> so is been on like, a chilly kick lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, uh, hey, honestly, it looked good. I was like, man, I wish I knew how to do something at the crockpot. Well, we go. <laughs> I mean, you just shoot yourself in the foot. Every, now that we go there, you're gonna have to like <laughs> have some chili, make something when we go visit. And you know, you're more than invited to come to Jackson. Florida and we eat some Venezuelan arepas it's yeah. happening uh no I'm, I love it and this is the best part of this right like we've uh, the conversation that we had over the last few weeks has been all about the relationships mm -hmm. that we build over content right and it's like okay mm -hmm. what's um just now the event that we were at um you know Dave which you guys work with like Dave uh um, Gerhard. Gerhard like what's was saying like was asking to the group like what do you feel when you publish like what are the things that you've noticed like about these things when you are consistent and building the relationships and it's about that because opportunities will follow right like you connect you talk you have things in common like game of thrones or crock pods or arepas or whatever that is right for mm -hmm. example we have a, we have a crazy story with uh with monica like this guest that came in this was when clubhouse was a really big thing before before sean you know tweeted that it was gonna fail and, and it was true <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, we jump on this room and it's just her and, uh, you know, she starts talking yep. to me and this was a person that came to the show and we're like, sweet, she lives in Boise, Idaho at the other side of the country where we're at. And we start having conversations like, where are you cooking? And I'm like, cooking uh, at night. I'm like, I'm making this thing called an arepa. She's like, oh my gosh, what, what's an arepa? And I'm like, well, I explain what it is. Two weeks later, we're in Boise, Idaho for an event and she texts and like, you guys are here. You have to come to my house and make the arepa, right? So we ended up meeting with her at her house, cooking this massive batch of arepas for her, her family. We ended up staying with them for like four days. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, she she is very in the community that we're in and was able to introduce us to incredible people that have meant the world to us and our business, not just like client-wise, but like mentors and people that helped us in very in, mm -hmm. in moments of need. So invest in that relationship from the get-go is incredible. So thank yeah. you for sharing like how you do it because I think a lot of people are missing the mark big time. And these are actionable steps that they can implement today to actually 
uh, make that happen and move that forward. So thank you. Totally. Totally. It, yeah. And like, yeah, it's, it's like those relationships can, can come very um, organically and like mm -hmm. result in y'all cooking a rapist together. Or it could be like, <laughs> I've, I've, I have like a DM for, from someone from like four years ago and then bumped into them in Austin like a week ago and now we're buds. It's like those, like, you know, there's so many dots that, that yeah. you can, like you can't connect in the moment. And then looking back, the, the, the standard Steve Man. Jobs saying it's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. So I feel like this has something to do with how then you transition into HubSpot, right? And I'm curious to hear that story. How was it? Uh, did you create the opportunity? The opportunity came to you because of these relationships. Uh, yeah. How did the Go experience go? Yeah. So after I exited the agency in early 2021, I kind of just spent a few months to kind of like try my hand at like my own podcast, which uh, didn't last long. <laughs> I, I still have dreams of bringing it back, but did that for a little bit and did some work with Noah Kagan, who's oh, um, nice. You know, big marketer. He he's been growing his YouTube channel really. His YouTube over the last game is on point. Like I <laughs> yeah. love, I've been loving his videos when he goes to houses and like call the outreach. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, his <laughs> producer is one of my best friends, Jeremy. Shout out to Jeremy Mary. Let's go. Um, <laughs> but I I started uh, you know writing YouTube scripts for him and doing podcast stuff for him, just kind of like part time basically while I was like kind of figuring my own stuff out. Yeah. And all in the background, sort of just like waiting for an opportunity. I knew, you know, I'd been in podcasting for like four years and I, was, I just sort of looked around. And I was like, okay, if I did uh, work with a the company, there's like a short list of who I'd want to work for. And HubSpot like was just clearly at the top. Like they're just doing the coolest shit. They acquire yeah. the hustle. My First Million is my favorite podcast. It just checked <laughs> all the boxes. And so I was like, yeah. how do I just beeline into getting myself into that organization? And so like Sam, over the course of like those you know, eight months that I was working for Noah, he would post like, Hey, looking for a producer or looking for a guest booker or whatever. And the timing was just never quite right each time. But then finally, after like three or four months, um, he posted another one and I was like, Oh, this is my opportunity. So yeah, around like, uh, I guess like August ish, like he posts something on Twitter saying, Hey, mm. looking for like a guest booker, I think. And I was like, he's like in the, in the tweet thread in this tweet, um, you know, you have 240 characters, like explain why you're the man for the job. I put mm. four bullets, like ran a podcast booking agency responsible for over like a thousand bookings, uh, blah, blah, blah. Just like kind of like yep. my resume and basically I said, this is my 10 second bio and <laughs> boom, boom, boom. And that got his attention. And also just through like him, him, him kind of knowing Noah and stuff like that, that also helped. But anyways, yeah. that was like what kind of got his attention. And then yeah. job posting comes up. I go through the whole process and I just start like basically, uh, you know, so for those who aren't familiar, like the hustle is a big tech and media newsletter and Sam's the founder of it. He also has my first million, his podcast. Um, and then within that, like HubSpot has a bunch of different like channels. So trends, uh, dot co is one of like the, basically like mm -hmm. the, the daughter things within the hustle. I know that was a little bit confusing, but anyways, I, I would host events through trend as another way to kind of get my name in front of, you know, decision makers at HubSpot. Yeah, so basically nice. like, 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 you know, ping Sam, ping like trends, ping like Steph, who's head of, uh, you know, the, the basically like all the kind of media going yeah. on at HubSpot and yeah. just like trying to sort of insert myself in all these different conversations and just add value up front. And so one of the first things I did was like, Hey Sam, uh, after like he responded to my, uh, my, my message, I, I DM'd him and I was like, Hey, here's a list of a hundred plus guests I could book on your show. Like in this month type of thing. Yeah. And you know, that also really excited him. And then I, I just started like kind of like doing work up front without any expectation mm -hmm. and whether it's the guest list or like these kind of spreadsheets on like how they could grow the show or whatever i just tried to like basically make it an absolute no-brainer for them to hire me so by the time like the actual job interview came around i'd already built out like all these different assets that i was able to like point to during the interviews and be like they're like how would you you know approach guest outreach and i'm like oh funny you asked that i've actually got this whole spreadsheet that i can send you <laughs> on ready. how i would approach it yeah you know so it's like it, it, it's sort of like a um, build once, sell twice type of thing where it's like you just build it all up front and maybe yeah. you never use it, but the odds are it's going to come handy in some way. Down Absolutely. The the, the, this is so inspiring, man. Thank you, by the way, for sharing the, the, the full story and how the pieces work together because mm -hmm. it does take work, right? Like it, it, mm -hmm. it, it's crazy. Like when in, and I, we've been probably both sides where we've been, you know, trying to find opportunities, right? And we've also, over the last two years, we've been on the side to, we need people to bring to the team. 
how do we handle that, right? Like who are we actually picking, right, for for these roles? And it's experiences like the one that you just described that normally we would like to to find those, right? Like so as a company, right, you're like, okay, how can I create an environment that I can, uh, you know, elaborate a little bit more on that? I'm mean, like, how can we attract that top talent, right? Especially like the event that we just were, like that was one of the main topics. But also on the other side, like for example, you know, for us, when we bring a guest, like it's, it's us, like we don't have a EA or a VA that, that does it. That's our decision because we love to connect on a one-on-one with our guests before they come in and, and build that relationship. It's a big part of what we do and, mm-hmm. and how we do it. Um, so I think also an important point is like you made the process like your own and you were so proactive. So um, yeah. do you like... Wait, wait, before you go on a, on a question here, there's a few points that I think they're so yeah. viable for, you know, the listener to understand. And it kind of goes back to those principles that you shared with the cold outreach, mm-hmm. which is the first one. And this is the acronym we use is WIFT, right? What's in it for them? And you, that's all you had in their mind. It's like, okay, how can I help them make what what they are doing even better, right? Okay, they need more quality guests. Guess what? Yeah. This is the list. I got the experience. I know how to do it. I know which guests will be absolutely amazing in your podcast because I consume your podcast, right? Then you're like, okay, who are the people that are around the environment that I want to be in? Cool. Let me be friends with them. Let me reach out to them. Uh, Plot twist right here. This podcasting is one of the best mediums to build those relationships. Um, So, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I Jonathan, obviously, I was like, this guy on LinkedIn is super cool. But at the same time, I was like, damn, this guy is the head of growth at uh, HubSpot. Let me see if I can, you know, try to bring it and have a conversation with him. And now, turns out we're like crockpot chili brothers over here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, I've been thinking about the marriage between crockpot, chili, and, are, and an arepa. And I'm like, I can't, I can't focus on the interview anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be very interesting. But... You know, you did all this by putting them in front of you and thinking what's in it for them. So, again, at the end of the of the day, you're just being selfless. You're leading with value. So when the opportunity presents itself, right? I mean, you're not being reactive. You're being total, total opposite. You're being 100% proactive in search of this opportunity. So, again, just mm-hmm. ask yourself, right, the listener right now, uh, what can I do proactively to go and take advantage of these opportunities. There is a possibility because you are not in control of whether the person on the other side says yes or no, but you are 100% in control on whether you deliver a lot of value up front to that relationship. 100%. Um, totally. how, can, how can people use this, uh, uh, I'll call it at scale, right? Like let's say you are using a, an, a strategy like this for whatever, getting clients, right? Like it's just you, maybe there's a one VA maybe, right? Like what, what's it like? It, can it be scalable, right? Like we, uh, how we, how we produce our show and there is the, the vehicle of our show, it's a step in our process, but we found mm-hmm. that a lot of people starting up, they might be very confused or intimidated, right? They're like, oh man, like that sounds like that sounds incredible, but it's like just the thought of like building all that out can cause uh, a lot of friction to actually mm-hmm. go ahead and execute it, right? So, is there a way to scale it? Like, how, where, where were some tools, automation? Was it a VA? Like, was it just you, right? And just consistency? What are some things and lessons that maybe you can bring to, to us? Yeah. As far as uh, lead gen for the agency, it was a lot of getting hiring EAs to, you know, pull the lists. And then, you know, they were honestly the ones kind of sending emails, uh, you know, those two, those two sentence emails, yeah. and then we would be able to responded to them. But yeah. a lot of that can be, you know, outsourced as far as finding the names and then, you know, clicking send on that, that mm-hmm. email. Yeah. Um, then on the guest booking side. So the tools I loved and used at our agency. So on the kind of research side, if you're trying to find podcasts to go uh, pitch, you can use a tool like Raphonic, R-E-P-H-O-N-I-C. And basically it's just a big uh, database that lets you search by keyword and find podcasts in your niche. Um, I always recommend if you're using a tool like that, like probably sort by listenership based on like you're going to get fed like the top shows out there. So if you type in like entrepreneurship or whatever, you'll see Joe Rogan at the top and people get bright eyes and they're like, oh, I can find Joe Rogan's producer's email. Like I actually recommend you start at the bottom of the list, start small and work your way up because A, by doing that, you're going to get better at interviewing. 
uh, or yeah. becoming a better interviewer. And two, like you're just going to be more likely to get a few wins under your belt. And then you can point to those wins and say, hey, I was on this podcast. Uh, yeah. We talked about X, Y, and Z. Would you be interested in having me on yours? So that's a great tool to find shows. And then as far as like managing your sorry, like your outreach, I used HubSpot. That that's, was another reason why I was super you know, gung-ho on like yes. you know, working at HubSpot because their tools are amazing. Um, so for all of the outreach, like I manage it all in like the, their CRM and leverage like their sales tool for different pipelines. I have a thread on Twitter. If anyone wants to check it out, it's pinned yes. to the very top of my tweets. And it kind of details all the different tools and mm. like how I used uh, HubSpot a little bit. Uh, so if you want to search at B-A-R, the number five H-O-P, it's my last name with the number yeah. five instead of A-S-S, -S, um, that, that thread will kind of at least point you in the right direction. But yeah, the main that, tools awesome. are Refonic for research, um, HubSpot kind of like, you know, backend CRM, like yep. uh, templates, email templates, all that stuff. And then, you know, a few other tools that I kind of detail in that thread are just sort of like how to add a little bit of extra you know, like personalization to each of your. Emails. I love it. By the way, yeah. the link is going to be right below. So all you got to do is scroll down and just, just click there and uh, it's going to take you directly to, to the profile. Yeah. And you mentioned yeah. something that is a principle that we shared before. We call it the levels of influence, right? And let's say Joe Rogan, the example that you, that you use is level a, right? Is probably one, if not the most difficult podcaster probably to communicate with, but you got influence level D, right? Which can be just a podcast that is a step or two above yours. And it's way easier to reach out to them, have them on your show or vice versa. You be in their show. And like you said, just get a few wins under your belt. And by doing that, you can kind of like go up that influence ladder step by step right. until eventually Go, get into your goal right yeah. again it's not going to be overnight it takes work a lot of time and a lot of consistency so you better understand that right yeah. but it's it's a great concept because a lot of people just try to aim so high at first and then they just get a bunch of losses and they get discouraged and they stop doing it when instead it's like hey there are so many options at one just one level above you that you can leverage right build those relationships focus on value we go back to the same same principles that we've talked about all the all the episode today and then you can move on mm. to the next one so thank you for sharing that i think that's extremely important totally and, and it goes also back to kind of what i was saying earlier of like kind of picking your lane and kind of sticking to it because yes. there are so many podcasts out there so if you are trying to go on every marketing show like that's going to be pretty overwhelming and like soon you'll be having like 200 you know outgoing emails and it's just sort of like a lot to manage but if you're like oh we're just focusing on content for this type of uh business leader or this type of company then that narrows your search down and you can have a list of 50 shows or whatever that probably actually would love to have you on because you're the perfect kind of like guest for that show yes yeah, absolutely oh this is so good i know i i, I want to transition here so a little bit though this is great i, I want to know the secret of like how we grew 40 percent in three months That's that, where Fonzie, we go, right? tell me we, we we had a super <laughs> clickbaity headline we need to deliver on that promise right so Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, crazy growth. Uh, honestly, we've been a fan since like almost the very beginning. I'm not gonna lie. I told my bro, I got it. I got him into the into that because I, I addiction. Yeah, I'm I, like he's guilty. Yeah, I, I followed the hustle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We became members of Trends since they launched it, mm -hmm. and when they started that podcast, I was like, man, this is awesome. Honestly, so I'm curious now. How? What did you guys do? to grow that podcast considerably, right? Specifically, I, I'm more interested in your role. Like what have been some of the things that you came in there, implemented and helped them literally scale that thing to the moon? Totally, yeah. Well, I think first off, it's important to note, like like you said, like the show is incredible. Like Sam and Sean are incredible. Yes. If you listen to an episode, there's a good chance you're going to listen to another episode and then another episode and then another episode. And so you can't get that, like, you can't knock that because it's incredible content, Absolutely. very, like, engaging hosts. So that's kind of, like, the, the baseline there. So, and then in terms of actually, like, getting audience. So my background is entirely in earned media, meaning I was doing podcasts, getting people guested, uh, sorry, getting people booked as guests on podcasts. No experience at all and paid. And so... Mm this last four months that I've been at the company has been like a 
literal MBA in like paid advertising and podcasting, and I've yeah, learned wow. so much. So I can I can kind of talk through some of this, some of the stuff we've done. Uh, we've done a lot. So yeah. you know, kind of like basically my job when I came in was like to build this this uh, podcast growth playbook. And based on like a lot of the research I had done in the space, I kind of came to this conclusion that like okay, Jordan Harbinger, he is sort of the I don't know if y'all are familiar with him, but yeah. he's yeah. got a wildly podcast and he's grown it from zero to 11 million downloads in like three years wow. and a lot of that you know there's there's definitely some caveats in there so he you know he had a, a show previously he ended up having a falling out with his like co-founders yeah. or whatever co-hosts and then so he had a little bit of like a built-in audience to begin with he also had a lot of relationships in the podcasting space that he could leverage to launch a show and say hey can you give me a shout out can i get on your show so i can't discount that but he's he's kind of said over the last you know, two years of all of his marketing budget has pretty much gone to two things. It's gone to uh, host red ads, uh, which is like, you know, y'all reading an ad for Jordan Harbinger's show yeah. and podcast buying ads on podcast players. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is a playbook for a, you know, someone who has substantial funds to grow a show. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you the background on this, but I can also give you the bootstrap version of it and how to, you know, approach with like $0 basically. Um, but yeah, for, for, for my first million, we had some substantial budget. So we invested in all the, all the things I just said, like host ads, yeah. podcast players. We, we did a lot of stuff. We did a lot of YouTube ads, um, which, you know, I don't think is like the smartest way to grow a podcast, but mm. Hey, if you have extra budget, you got to put it somewhere. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, th- there's a lot of other like channels that we leveraged. Um, but, but at the end of it, at the end of like, you know, testing all this stuff from basically October to December, what we came back to is okay. The most effective things over that time period were one host red ads, um, at, at least for us, like because we had the budget we could spend, and we saw okay yeah. if we spend this amount of money, we can get this these many subscribers. Yeah. So um, that was one piece of it. The podcast players, you know, to varying degrees, you'll get success. Um, one of the most successful ones we ran was on Castbox, but you know that's like a ten thousand dollar buy. So again, it's not cheap. Yeah. Um, and then the third component was these kind of like viral giveaways that we did. So we did one thing where we did like a clips contest where we basically crowdsourced from our audience to create amazing clips. I think y'all actually did some of them as well. <laughs> yeah, and... we did. Uh, we're still waiting for the, the 5K. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be doing another contest. So, so I know, it's good. Gotta, y'all's. I'm just going to say that we got to step up our game yeah. 100%. The, the, our team, they were like, they were on it and they were, they're not happy. And they were like, when is the next one? So they're, they're ready. Yeah. They're ready. I love, I love that strategy. Love that. that was that was genius from you guys. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that was a big one. Um, we also did different, like we did a giveaway where we said because not everyone can afford to you know get like different prizes to give away and stuff like that. So yeah. we did another giveaway where basically you could win sixty minutes of time with Sam and Sean, which you know is oh, super so valuable. Yeah. So that was another uh, really successful one. And basically, we just we just figured out that we have this like very diehard audience of fans, kind of like an army of people that are ready to take action, you know, sort of at a a moment's call. And so that's sort of like one of the biggest levers that we're using to grow the pod Mm -hmm. uh, now is like crowdsourcing content, finding people who are genuine, genuine fans of the show and maybe like buying ads on their show, that kind of thing. Um, And then, yeah, just like the podcast players, like those are kind of all the low hanging fruits. Yeah. I, I, um, I feel like since you guys launched that contest and got the results, Sam has not stopped talking about how awesome <laughs> and how in shock he is. And um, we, you know, we obviously paid a very close attention uh, to it because obviously we were participating and, you know, 100%, we could have done 100% better every single time. Just that, that's the growth mindset, we can, right? We can always do better. Always do better. But we're like very close to what's hap- what was happening around, right? And it was incredible because you guys got people from all over the place. And then on the mm. marketing side as well, we were very curious to see what the result of that was going to be. So just on the micro asset side of things, millions of impressions, right? So just as, as brand awareness, and people consume content in, in, in different ways, in different platforms, right? So the TikTok consumer will enjoy the TikTok content, might be aware that there's a podcast, right? And because of the repetition, the points of contact that happens there, whenever they transition into listening to a podcast, they will tune in, right? Same thing happens with YouTube, same things happen with other platforms. I think that's super valuable. You know, we obviously that's part of our product and and how we help people, right? So we're going to obviously advocate for this, but we call it a safety net effect, right? So you're developing this audience and the way that you guys executed it, right? Like you guys had a budget, right? Like it was out there, but for, for some people that, or or the nationalities where they are, those $5,000 is 
life changing, right? It could be like a full year worth of living expenses for some, right? And yeah. uh, it was a great motivator for them, like the the trade to do this and the exposure that you guys got was incredible. So I I truly hope that you guys keep doing whether you know. Whether it's us, we, we honestly, like, that will be just this experience, this exchange has been so worth it. But just the fact that some people can put their, their foot out there and in, in an even field play and, and have that opportunity. And it's a win-win for literally everybody, right? Because now mm -hmm. they also have a case study that they can go and be like, hey, by the way, this is what I did with this brand or with this mm -hmm. podcast, right? And they can go and actually follow those opportunities, right? With yeah. the amazing cold outreach strategies that you've been saying all day. So... I, yeah, I, I totally. think it's, it was a great execution. So thank you for I, sharing. I have two two questions, um, and we got about five minutes left here. But that these are the the main questions that come to mind. First, of course, you, I, like you mentioned, they already had kind of like an audience that you guys can leverage, and you guys have a big budget that you can take advantage of, right? So for the bootstrappers out there, right? How can they do these things if maybe they don't have a diehard audience at first right and they don't have a really big budget and I, i i'm pretty sure this is go on the side of the guerrilla marketing type of deal but i'm curious mm -hmm. to listen your your thoughts on this and then the other thing is you guys were running paid media are you guys turning that earned media into owned uh media right are you guys uh getting people's emails addresses and then you know, doing email campaigns when you guys release new podcasts or leveraging that as leads for HubSpot. I'm extremely curious on how you guys are, because I know advertisers for a fact, like we've been living in this world, specifically in the direct response marketing world. You don't want to just spend the money and just leave it out there in the ether, right? You want to capitalize in a way. So I'm curious how you guys are doing that. Yeah, like... It's funny when I came on, I was expecting like, you know, joining HubSpot and all these, you know, huge company and hustle, you know, incredible team. But when I got to my first million, it's literally Sam, Sean, the producer and like their researchers <laughs> and that's it. And like they have conversations with the HubSpot team and make sure everything's on track. But it's like they are their own operation, siloed yeah, yeah. kind of in their own you know world. Nice. And I was just like, that was kind of like a shock to me. Um, mm. so like a lot of those just like the reason there isn't like a weekly newsletter is cause like, we just haven't like prioritized it yet, but like, you know, we have all the, <laughs> the capabilities. We have this huge company to do yeah. it. So those are like kind of like the someday maybe type things that we're definitely like going to be doing in the near future. But in terms of like taking some of that, that paid media and turning it into like owns. So perfect example is the clips contest. The guy who ended up winning that, we basically ended up hiring him oh, and, nice. uh, you know, Per, like more or less like kind of he he handed over like a lot of the videos that he created for us and now we're turning those videos into instagram and spotify ads yes. so yeah totally like that's that's another like beautiful part of that is the kind of like secondary uh use you get out of like a lot of those pieces of content yeah. um and then i think you also had a question about like how to bootstrap mm -hmm. uh if you are trying to do some of these things so uh, so i think If you are already have a show and you're trying to grow it and you don't have a lot of money, um, guesting on other shows and figuring out ways to do like swaps with other sh with uh, with other uh, mm. uh, podcasts mm -hmm. or um, yeah, figuring out some sort of structures where you could do sort of cross promos with with other shows that are of similar size. Like that's always a good thing. That could be anything from like guesting on each other's shows to y'all each run an ad on each other's shows to. Um, a full episode drop within each other's RSS feeds. Oh, I love um, that. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of skin that cat, but yeah, that is the best way to do it is just, or, you know, kind of what, what would, you know, a lot of what I've been talking about is like kind yeah. of cold outreach and trying to figure out a win-win for, for, for both parties. Yeah. Um, and then a way to kind of go. So if you're thinking about like doing a giveaway, this is a cool hack mm -hmm. that I recently learned. Um, I think giveaways for a podcast are great for like spark in the like flash in the pan type thing. So if you're if you're launching a show yeah. like we just did with the Hustle Daily show, um, we ran a contest. It was hugely successful. We got to the number one chart spot in the the business news section, and we're up there with like Bill O'Reilly and stuff stuff like that. And I just got a shout out. Um, yeah, <laughs> let's go, yeah. Pat. Uh, <laughs> there we um, go. And so basically. Yeah. So like what we did there was we 
I, I totally lost my train of thought. I was saying, oh, launch. Okay, yeah, so what they we did there they was give away. we had like, yeah, yeah we had like, uh, you know, tech giveaway. We, we gave away iPad, I, I, mm. AirPods, stuff like that. And we created this funnel that basically was just like a viral loop. So anyone who entered the contest, the first thing they had to do was follow the podcast because a lot of people don't know this, but like the best, the only way to, not the only way, if you were trying to chart on Apple, yeah, uh, follows are the most important thing. Like mm. you should just get everyone to try to follow. Don't leave a review. Don't you know? Maybe download and listen a little bit, but follows are the most important thing. So, the yeah. the campaign I set up was like, okay, get people to follow, and then on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, we posted videos of the giveaway, and the next call to action was uh, like and comment on the on that post. And so that way, you have a consistent flood of people like liking and commenting on the contest giveaway post. And so it's just like a viral loop of people constantly like entering and getting more points when they promote mm. the, the podcast. And then the more it's promoted on social, more people see it. So that's a big component of it. We also ran some Facebook ads in the background, but that's nice. not worth highlighting. And then, um, so yeah, that, it's like a seven day contest. And so yeah, we, we have $5,000 worth of tech gadgets that were given away, but a way to do this for free is you, uh, and, and this is taken from another podcast that just recently launched. One of my buddies launched this. Uh, show for a barbecue and grilling YouTuber. Oh. And he's got like a little bit of an audience to begin with. And what he did was he reached out to different brands in his space, whether it was like a, a, a grill company or like a barbecue sauce company or whatever. Yeah. And he was like, hey, I'm running this big giveaway. Uh, would you want to give me a free product? And in return, you get promo for that product. It, we're doing this huge giveaway. Like you're going to get a ton of eyeballs on this. And so it's that's a really cool way to kind of growth hack it of being like, reach out to brands that you think uh, your podcast, your giveaway aligns with, yeah. see if they give you free product and then you don't have to spend a penny. And yeah. it's incredible. Like people say, like people would say no to this and you'll be surprised how many people say yes. So we've mm -hmm. done it with uh, small businesses and different things. Uh, and it was directly related to like a funnel and it was a, a whole thing. And I think the la the last one that we did on that specific thing, completely organically, no ads, no nothing. It was 2,000 leads in about two days, just like three emails that it was six different businesses. And by the way, if you're listening and you work in a local business, like a small business, this is perfect because you don't have to like do any kind of like paid media side of things. And then after that, it was like a quick transition to 300 bookings, 300 people going to like a wellness studio, right? And you're like, what? We like... They, they thought it was a mistake, right? So these things, like, people will say yes. You just have to go ask, right? And use the frameworks that, that you know, we've shared here today. This the, this episode is probably one of my favorites so far. It's good. Uh, not, not, I'm, we don't say this to everybody, by the way. <laughs> I'm just going to put this out there. You, uh, you're going to have to listen to every episode yeah, yeah. just to prove that just statement to, right, you know? I know. <laughs> Uh, dude, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm going to put this out there, part two at some point, because oh, yeah, sure. uh, one of the things with that- the With the chili. With the chili and the <laughs> arepas, like, you know, um, I really wanted to explore frameworks on how you guys stay consistent. That's one of the, the top friction points in a lot of things, and I don't think we'll have time mm -hmm. right now, but uh, I really want to explore that. But Fonzie, I don't know. Any last thoughts? Just uh, the last question good. is, because there's been plenty of action points in today's episode, but where would you be- if you didn't create content, if you didn't publish? Man, I see, I am like not the most active person on Twitter. I don't have like a ton of blog posts or anything like that. But the act of going through that and like, I, I think this is kind of like a, a, a something that doesn't get written about or talked about enough. But it's like, if you are doing like the reps sort of behind the scenes, and even if you don't press publish, I think there's still a lot of value there. For example, mm -hmm. I was saying that when I left the, the agency in like February, I started my own yeah. podcast. I never like really released it, but I, I learned so yeah. much through the process of like, I, I did all the things. I interviewed guests and I tried to figure out the formatting and nothing just like really stuck with me and like called me, but I am such a better like host slash interviewee slash like producer, all the things because I went through that and I never published a lot of it, but yeah. I, I have all the skills now. And I think that's kind of like a lot of people say you have to press publish, you have to push, press publish. And I do think like you totally should. But if you don't and you're still kind of like, you know, working on stuff behind the scenes, it's not the worst thing in the world. So I, I would say, you know, consistency and all that stuff is super important. But, you know, people fall off the wagon. Like I tried to build a daily writing habit and I did for, you know, like three months and then I fell off the wagon and I, now I don't. Yeah, but yeah. like I think I think also people tend to hold that stuff to like close to the chest and say like, you have to consistently write, you have to consistently whatever, whatever. But like so much of the writing I do like is just like through work emails. And that is like 
a short, yeah. effective, like writing, you know, it's like when I'm crafting yep. an email to get someone booked, like that might as well be a blog post because it's like, so Ops. it's so, you know, you're so being, you're being so nitpicky with every word you choose. Mm -hmm. Same is true of like a report that I'm sending, like my higher ups, I need every word to be like crystal clear and like super detailed. And so like, even if I'm not pressing publish on a lot of these things, like publicly, anytime I click send on one of those emails or whatever, I, I sort of treat that as like my own pressing publish. If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. That's such a cool answer. I'm very different to what we've seen in the past episodes too, because it's doing the reps, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like, what is it? Is that every single message? I mean, at the end of the day, that's still publishing, right? It's just publishing to one person. I, when we first started publishing, it was a Facebook live and we had one person, right? It was Fonzie listening to mine and I was listening to his. Right? <laughs> roasting each other in there. Uh, but it was like, <laughs> that, that was the thing that, that started to create momentum, right? And eventually, right? If, if, we're very big fans of creating your own framework, your own systems, like your own team, right? That's how really you can adapt and move very quickly, right? Uh, and a lot of people still, I feel like need to, that needs to be understood, right? It's like, no, well, the production of this, I can give it to an intern or I can give it to like this person that doesn't know me, doesn't know the stories, doesn't know, like have, hasn't published ever. So the fact that you went through the reps and, and share this openly to where like, the reps doesn't mean that it has to be public. The reps can be every single email, every single DM, every single Slack message that we put out there. That's still so valuable because it's gonna it's gonna help you take it to the next level. So thank you for for sharing that. Yeah, totally. Jonathan, where can people find you? Where can people connect with you? Uh, you know, maybe if they wanna read this this tweet, get cold email. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On Twitter, on Instagram, it's my my last name, Barshop number five instead of the letter S. So B-A-R-5-H-O-P. If you Google my name, I'm sure you'll find all the different socials and all that stuff. And my DMs are pretty much wide open. So hit me up. Awesome. Yeah. I, I just hit him up when I saw the <laughs> chili thing. I was like, yo, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, I'm curious. Why... <laughs> yeah, can I, can I get some chili? Uh, I'm curious, why the five instead of the S? Because bar shop's taken, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> You know, it's one of those like dead accounts with like one person who's, oh, who's following it. And I wanted to have like a universal Instagram, but it yeah. is on podcasts. It's tough to say. So I think I need to rethink that a little bit, but it also just kind of looks badass. So that's another reason. It does. Why. Look, it, it, it can also be if you ended up doing like some merch or stuff like a totally. hat with a logo that could be Gary like, a has is like five, like Gary V always throws up the number five. So I could, I could steal that yeah. from him or something. There, there we go. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I think it's pretty cool. So, yeah, I was curious if there was like an epic story behind it. Uh, not so epic, <laughs> but it's still a pretty cool story. <laughs> that, it just threw you on the bus big time. I mean, all the rapport that we were able to build for an hour at the it's window gone. is gone. So, <laughs> by the way, pick up, bro. Fonzie is out of, out of the question. You good? Part two, yeah. part two not happening. Uh, yeah, but, not happening. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, we got live feedback over here. The five looks great. Let's go. Thank Thanks, you, Pen. <laughs> Love you, Pen. Uh, Jonathan, anything else you, you would like to add before we head out? Um. No, I mean, I, I guess like to kind of reiterate on that last point, it's like you can be doing a lot of stuff in behind the scenes that, you know, in kind of like kicking yourself because you aren't like out there pressing publish and like being public about it. Mm -hmm. But I think with everything, it's like there's seasons of life. And so like right now, I just don't have the time and energy to like publicly press publish, but I'm still building like all the you know tools and, and like systems and like my own crafting my own sort of like voice behind the scenes to where yeah. when it is a season to like, be in promo mode and, and do more of this kind of stuff like it's going to be super dialed in and like i'm going to be kind of ready and prepared so i think that's, that's something cool. i'll just leave people with is like even if you don't feel like you're making progress and you see a lot of other people like pressing publish yeah. and doing all this cool stuff on social um it doesn't feel like you're making progress but you actually are ah uh, so that's so important to understand thank you for sharing that and by the way as soon as you do that we're gonna be like uh keeping an eye very closely <laughs> because the thing that you do is like literally the secret sauce to all of this. Uh, cause you're like, yeah. in he's, the mix. A, he's a genius behind the madness. Dude, it's been, <laughs> uh, it was a pleasure, man. Thank you so much again for, yeah. for coming up today. Fancy anything else you want to add before we head out? No, man. Thank you so much. It was an absolute honor having you here. Yeah. Come visit in, in Jacksonville. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. Let me know when y'all come to Austin.
We'll get some chill. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> For F F one next year has to happen. We're big fans, so we gotta we gotta we'll hang out. All right. <laughs> With that said, thank you so much for tuning into a content profit podcast. Go ahead and follow the show in your favorite podcasting platform and on social media at Biz Bros Go. That is right. And if Jonathan here help you move one step closer to what we go, please don't forget to share this episode and and I'm not gonna ask you for a review, but a follow. <laughs> so see ya. Bye guys. Bye.